Emotional dominance precedes physical damage, and this explains what will happen or not happen when violence threatens. This is my message for today. The emotional relationship between the persons involved determines the trajectory of violent situations. I'll draw on evidence from several kinds of violence, quarrels and fights among individuals in small groups, violent crimes such as holdups and rapes, violence in demonstrations and riots, and military combat or other organized violence. Most theories about violence are misleading. If we actually look at situations where violence is threatened, the striking fact is most of the time violence does not come off. It aborts or becomes a standoff. When violence does manage to break through, it is typically incompetent and the fighters do relatively little damage to each other. This is not our predominant image of violence. We think that violence is a raging rampage in which angry, embittered, or honor-prone persons give way to pent-up urges and commit atrocious acts of beating, shooting, exploding, or torturing. Not that such things don't happen, but our biggest problem with understanding violent causality is for a long time, almost everything we knew about it came from sampling on the dependent variable. Violence, figure, violence figures prominently in the headlines in the news media, chiefly when it is especially blatant and atrocious. The fact that a fight does not come off or that it is no more than a scuffle is never newsworthy. The same problem exists with most crime statistics since they report the crimes that happen, not those that could have happened but didn't. The problem was worse when statistics consisted only of crimes known to the police, which in effect meant crimes that are made their way through the bureaucratic reporting system. Victim surveys give somewhat better data, but they are hazy about what actually happened and misses most of the violence that aborts. Probably the best statistical data in this respect are on sexual harassment and rape, since the research is usually designed to get the largest number of responses, but the data as yet have rarely been analyzed for clues as to when sexual advances do or do not escalate to the more serious sexual violence. It is possible, however, to avoid sampling on the dependent variable and to get insight into threatening situations before violence happens. One method is close ethnography of everyday life. Researchers like Elijah Anderson and more recently Alice Goffman and Joe Krupnik, and uh, you'll ex ex excuse me, the names of the people I'm going to drop here basically are people I, I know, my, my colleagues, my, my students, and there are many more uh, who really ought to be, be named. Uh, the, the, these researchers have spent years living with gang members and street people and have provided much information about when violence is threatened but does not happen, under what micro-contingencies it breaks out, when it is milder or more serious, and how it stops. And now we have new sources of data, CCTV cameras, which show us quarrels in pubs as well as stick-ups on the street and the gestures of bank robbers mobile phone videos posted online, online from which uh, Anna Nassauer has been able to reconstruct the multiple perspectives of participants in protests and when a demonstration turns into a riot. Curtis Jackson Jacobs, who shows how fights escalate and wind down, move by move. Don Vanick in Amsterdam, who uses multiple interviews on all sides to show when ordinary scuffles escalate into vicious beatings. The theoretical starting point, I have argued, is that most threatened violence does not come off. Why not? Most commonly, people who threaten each other get into an emotional equilibrium or standoff. Their postures and angry talk eventually becomes repetitive and boring. In conversational recordings, the most characteristic feature of conflict talk is that speakers repeat the same phrases over and over again, both talking at the same time and trying to talk over the other. After this goes on through a certain number of repetitions, they start to tire. 
The tone declines. The quarrel winds down with a ritualized gesture of contempt for the whole situation, slamming the door or stamping away in disgust. Stalemates can also happen at a low level of actual violence. In protest demonstrations, often a few individuals at the front make insulting gestures and hurl rocks. The police line typically stand their ground behind their shields. As long as this goes on, no real damage is done. As we shall discuss later, the configuration of the crowd and the police changes drastically when serious violence actually happens. The solid lines that you see at the beginning break up and little clusters attack isolated victims. Most of what happens in violence threatening situations is bluster. People make hostile gestures, adopt postures, and hurl their voices in anger and insult. But such blustering behavior typically stops short of violence. As I will elaborate further on, violent, vi bluster is not entirely pretense. It is an effort to establish emotional dominance, and it will facilitate real violence if it succeeds, if it succeeds emotionally. But most of the time, bluster doesn't work, and the result is stalemate. A striking variant on dramatic blustering is gesturing with guns that happens in the world of street gangs in Philadelphia. Elijah Anderson describes two well-known killers confronting one another in a, in a nightclub. This is in the really tough black part of the, of the city. They're insulting each other over, over possession of a beautiful woman who's accompanying one of them. Everyone else in the room holds their breath. The in, insulted tough guy who came in with the woman pushes open his jacket reveals the butt of his gun, and after a dramatic pause, I'm letting you live for now. Then he grabs his woman, come on, bitch, we're, get, we're getting out of here. The onlookers collectively exhale and break into a burst of excited conversation. Both tough guys handle themselves well, that is, dramatically, but making move and counter move in equilibrium with an appropriately dramatic exit. The gossip network buzzes with the story for months, then settles onto something else. The two killers have not shot each other yet. This incident happened in the 1990s. 10 years later, gesturing with guns seems to have evolved into an accepted mode of communication. On a Southern California school playground, members of a Chicano gang call out rival gang members from inside the school. But both sides confine themselves to flashing gang signs with their fingers. Uh, and pulling their, up their shirts to reveal the butts of guns stuck in their waistbands. Back in Philadelphia, street tough guys flash their guns, sometimes even pull them out. Yet, even these incidents, for the most part, do not lead to shooting at each other. Alice Goffman describes a whole array of gun gesturing, showing a bulge in your pocket to imply you have your hand on a gun actually displaying part of the gun, pulling it out but keeping it pointed at the ground, pointing it in the air. Some of, some of these moves demand refined timing and understanding just what kind of gun gesturing is blustering and what is serious threat. This is a collective game and understanding between experienced persons on both sides. The micro details of how this works remains to be investigated. Joe Krupnik, in his Chicago ethnography of uh, gun carrying uh, uh, gang members, notes that sometimes experienced fighters will actually fire a shot in the air. Not so much because they want to fight, nor even to scare off their opponents, but because they know the Chicago police will come soon after a gunshot, giving them all a good excuse to escape from a threatening scene. Such understandings about gun gesturing should not be taken to mean that no one ever tries to shoot anyone, but that happens in a different kind of micro-interactional situation. Shooting is more likely in a drive-by, where one side rapidly fires into an enemy group without very close aim. This minimizes the amount of confrontation because it happens so rapidly, and no one stares into anyone's face. Mutual bluster can escalate to fighting when one group makes an incursion into another's turf. But participants' description of such events typically show a confused scene 
with hasty firing and then the invaders beating a retreat back to their own terrain. As we know from the tactics of burglars and street robbers, most such criminals prefer to do their robbing close to their own neighborhood, even if more lucrative targets are further away. Places carry emotional tones, relatively more secure and confident for its habitués, more tension raising for outsiders. Violent crime is very much a matter of place because of these kinds of emotional processes. I've been describing a variety of ways in which violence is aborted or deliberately self-regulated through dramatic gestures. Blustering remains important even when real violence is attempted, when weapons and missiles are hurled and shots are fired. Violence itself can be a form of bluster, as Dave Grossman argued in reviewing the history of weapon systems. On the whole, soldiers within sight of the enemy did not fire their weapons very accurately, so there was relatively little danger in standing one's ground when both sides were doing little damage. Here, the firing of weapons is itself a form of bluster, an attempt to make the other side lose their nerve and their coherence. The very sound of gunfire can be unnerving, and big guns, long-distance artillery, typically have their effect, not so much by the casualties they cause, since <laughs> artillery, too, until quite recently, has been rather inaccurate, but by its psychological effect. This is especially true in urban warfare, where hammering buildings apart by artillery has been the main tactic that in the past has brought urban uprisings to an end. Apt illustrations are in the 1916 to 1922 Irish Rebellion and Civil War, where blasting apart the post office and then later on uh, several other monuments it, you know, effectively brought those particular uh, episodes to an end. You know, not because a lot of people were getting killed in the buildings, but the dramatic effect of the building falling down around you. Historically, armies dramatized themselves by battle cries, the ominous sound of drums, the eerie wails, wail of bagpipes. And this was not mere pageantry, since in successful battles, the winning side managed to make the losers break and run before they actually came into contact. It is only when one side loses their nerve or becomes tangled up in trying to move to another position that the capability of an organized military force to resist breaks down. This is the danger point, since most damage is done when one side is no longer resisting while the still coherent force goes into the frenzied attack that I've called a forward panic. What's going on on the micro level in such situations? Violent confrontation when persons are locked together in a common focus of attention but at cross purposes, generates a high level of tension on both sides. We can see this from visual data, especially from today's telephoto lenses. In the early phases of a quarrel, faces often look angry. But at the moment when people actually do something, their faces turn from anger to fear. I interpret this to mean that the baseline of human interaction is to become entrained, caught up in the other's gestures and mood. But conflict locks people together into antag antagonistic directions, and the result is palpable tension in face and body. That is why fighters, if they get that far to open violence, are generally incompetent. When they fire their guns, they usually miss, even though they may be good shots on the firing range. In real situations confronting another human, their aim deteriorates. This was also true in the era of spears, swords, and edged weapons. And it is true of the fist fighters that we see in Jackson Jacobs' uh, videos. Confrontational de tension deteriorates their ability to fight. Grossman gives a physiological explanation. Conflict elevates heart rate at successively high levels one loses, first of all, fine motor coordination, such as one trigger finger, then gross motor coordination. It, finally, at very high levels of uh, physiological arousal comes complete paralysis. The technique of fighting, quite literally, is a contest to elevate, elevate the other side's confrontational tension so that they become helpless while keeping one's own tension down to a level where a violent attack can still be carried out. 
We can see this from the inside in the subjective phenomenology reported by police officers who have been in shootouts. They describe perceptual distortions like a blur of activity, tunnel vision focusing in on just the opponent's hands, temporary deafness to all sounds, even their own gunshots, and time slowing down so that what takes only a few seconds seems like a dreamlike eternity. To summarize, the most important techniques of violent conflict are moves to establish emotional dominance. And most physical damage follows when and if one side gets emotional dominance over the other. The lead up to violence and the carry through to actual physical injury is a two part process with contingencies along the way. Sequences from the near past into the near future are crucial for whether violent threat will build up. Most kinds of violence have an emotional history, and I uh, you know, want to you know, emphasize the uh, maybe novel nature of, the, of that, that kind of concept. It's a history of a matter of minutes. Within 10 or 20 minutes is probably the emotional uh, history of uh, most uh, conflicts as they get into that danger zone. And it's rarely more than three hours uh, long, which is, you know, typically applies to the major phase of a riot. These time periods are the causal zone determining whether someone threatens violence, whether it will actually break out, and what kind of result it will have. One implication of my argument is that motives from further back in time, that is really further back than 20 minutes ago or several hours ago, motives further back in time, grudges, jealousy, sense of injustice, plans for robbery or revenge, etc are not the crucial determinant of what will happen. I'm not denying that people have motives, but motives are a weak and a remote and causally weak explanation of what occurs in violence threatening confrontation. This applies also to persons who are ideologically motivated, whether freedom fighters for some ideal or prejudiced defenders of an old order. Whatever one's motives, they still have to go through the eye of the needle and that is the situation where two sides confront. Persons who are racist or homophobes are no better at violence than anyone else. They too experience confrontational tension when they come to the situational sticking point. And they too are successfully violent only if the micro conditions are present. Recall what I said earlier about sampling on the dependent variable. When what news reports of outrageously racist, homophobe, or mass rampage attacks do not see are how many such outrages are thought up by people, or even talked about, by people who never carry them out. The same applies to more commonly imputed, imputed motives for violence. Childhood abuse, post-traumatic stress, being disrespected, lacking moral norms, etc. I will state this in extreme form. It doesn't matter what your motives are for violence if you cannot find a technique and an opportunity to get through a confrontational situation and establish emotional dominance, you will not commit the violence. At the end of my talk, I will argue that this is a good thing. Motives for violence are ubiquitous and hard to eradicate, but situational opportunities are like the narrow eye, eye of a needle that might well be made narrower and harder to get through. Now I would like to summarize some recent research that shows very clearly the sequential nature of pathways to violence. It brings out the two-phase sequence. First, a period in which confrontational tension builds up. Secondly, a period when the tension is released into violence. There are micro contingencies in both phases. First, a series of little interactions, signals, and events that build up the tension or keep the tension down. At the outset of the second phase, if you get that far, a big turning point contingency, whether mutual tension results remains in equilibrium or stalemate, or whether one side establishes emotional dominance, allowing serious violence to unfold. And I'll pause for a drink and a dramatic uh, tension building. Plot tension moment. All right. All right. <laughs> 
The research is a PhD dissertation completed this year by Anna Nassauer at the Humboldt University of Berlin, for which I was an advisor. This work uses cutting edge methods from today's information technology. So we get a composite view of the many micro situations that make up large scale phenomena of conflict and violence, in this case, protest demonstrations. Nassauer assembles hundreds of hours of visual footage from mobile phone cameras, plus still photos taken by protesters, observers, news media, and police. In many of the scenes, we also have audio recordings hearing the vo voices and noises at different moments. She pins down time and location by combining online st street view maps, police radio traffic, and participants' accounts. In short, this is the most comprehensive view we have yet of what happens in a riot, not just in its most egregious moments of violence, but what led up to them, how they end, and especially importantly, when and where within the larger mass of persons, the demonstration, where, where in the mass of demonstra the demonstration is not violent. Nassauer compares 30 demonstrations in Germany and the United States, oversampling so that half of them turned out to be violent while half remained peaceful. It's important to realize that most protest demonstrations are, are not violent. I mean, the, the ratio is nowhere near 50-50. It's more like 95-5. And this is in keeping with my theoretical point that confrontational tension is normal and violence does not easily happen. NASA is seeking the sequence of micro conditions when demonstrations end in violence and when they remain peaceful. Emotions are the most important micro-mechanism determining these contingencies. And we now have methods for reading emotions from visual data. Now we've got all, all this uh, you know, video feed, feed. What are the emotions in it? Uh, we particularly rely on Paul Ekman's research on uh, facial uh, expressions and body postures. For instance, in Nassauer's data, she points to a moment, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is from the videos, when tension is high. A line of police are outnumbered by protesters. They're tensing their muscles. They're holding their truncheons tightly, and they look nervously over their shoulders from attacks from behind. But there are other moments when the police and protesters look calm and relaxed, even bored. And I should add parenthetically, boredom is actually a cru crucial emotion that we actually uh, want to cultivate in situations of this sort. <laughs> boredom is our, our savior on the whole. The contrast between these two kinds of situations is clear in my own collection of hundreds of photos of demonstrations and riots. Uh, with Nassauer's method of assembling the video recordings and getting them into a time sequence, we have a key to the phases of conflict, when tension builds up and when it turns into violence. The question now is, what kind of conditions lead to these emotional shifts? What determines the time sequences, the emotional fields, and the turning points? I'm going to uh, uh, boil down Nassauer's analysis to two major pathways to violence. First, a loss of control pathway resulting in a so-called police riot. And second, a demonstrator's offensiveness pathway. Let's start with the loss of control pathway. The key ingredients are a combination of spatial incursions plus police organizational breakdown. Spatial incursions are when either the demonstrators or the crowd control forces do not stay in the zone assigned to them. <coughs> they deviate from the parade route. They break through barriers. They plunge into the opposing line. One might think this is obvious. You can't fight unless you come into contact. But opposing sides don't need to make physical contact in order to fight. Violence is often carried out at a distance by throwing or firing. But it is especially the close bodily confrontation that happens in a spatial incursion that shifts the emotional field and opens up a time period of sustained violence. One's own turf, temporary though it may be, is one's comfort zone. Confrontational tension rises the more closely the bodies of the opposing sides are locked in full channel communication. I mean, I think that's the major result of getting bodies clo close to e each other. I mean, it's not just that you can uh, uh, see them, but you know, uh, hear, smell, uh, you know, probably even you know, more you know, you know, subtle ways in which you know, pe people uh, 
pick, pick things up from people getting very close to you. I might add here, parenthetically, an FBI agent told me that most shootings happen within two meters of each other, but the closer they get, the more likely they are to miss. And in a demonstration, there's an additional source of emotional tension. Turf incursions produce an emotional grievance. The other side is not respecting an agreement, acting unfairly and irrationally, and cannot be trusted. Now add the second ingredient. Organizational breakdown occurs when police units become cut off from each other. Higher command loses track of its own forces or of the location of different groups of demonstrators. Logistics break down so the police and the field are stressed by long hours without relief or toilet breaks or by inadequate food and water. Tension among the police is exacerbated when their organization breaks down and police units feel that they do not have the backup they ordinarily could call for help. That is to say, there are numerous sources of emotional tension and those arising from physical stress or feelings of being abandoned by one's own side add to the confrontational tension that is the dangerous emotional field of potential violence. Under such conditions, the police become tense and fearful. Rumors spread among them. The demonstrators have been making violent threats or deadly attacks have, been, have taken place on isolated police cars. These are often inaccurate or exaggerated accounts. On occasion, as in the bloody anti-WTO anti demonstration in Genoa in 2001, an unaccompanied police car was attacked in an isolated area when surrounded by demonstrators. But the emotional effect of such incidents, and particularly of the reports of, of them, become amplified into a siege mentality everywhere. I'll return to this point about rumor amplification among the police at the end of the talk. Here we can insert into the model the finding of micro-sociology of violence. Confrontations that threaten violence produce expressions of tension and fear. Most situations, the violence does not come off because both sides are in inhibited by the tension. The trigger to violence is to find an opening in which the opponent momentarily shows weakness allowing one side to acquire emotional momentum. Thus, emotional dominance precedes most physical da damage. The dangerous moment in a police riot is when high tension has built up among the police, followed by a micro-trigger that sets off the police, re-establishing their dominance by their superior use of force. Police typically view a crowd as consisting of a small number of potentially violent troublemakers plus a much larger group of peaceful demonstrators. And in fact, this is empirically correct. In all the visual evidence and photos of riots, the portion of the crowd engaged in violence is almost always far outnumbered by those who stand at a different distance and look. But police also believe that the small violent group can infect the majority taking them over emotionally and turning them all irrationally violent. This is from interviews cited by Nassauer. And I, and I would add that this uh, fits the data about subjective phenomenology that I was talking about earlier from Dave Klingman and, and others. So at the moment when the violence actually breaks out, uh, police officers get uh, uh, tunnel vision, they're focusing on, on, you know, on just the, you know, the action immediately in, in, in front of them. So that the, the earlier perception of uh, yeah, there are a few uh, people here who are violent, and there are lots of other people who really aren't. At that point, it becomes kind of an emotionally blurred situation, and at least for those, you know, a, a few seconds of time, you can't actually see the difference. And that's the, when the police, after a buildup of attention, launch an attack, they no longer distinguish between the two groups and tend to indiscriminately beat those in their path who are ready targets, including non-resisting persons, women, even bystanders in news media. This is the pattern which is often seen in photographs of police or crowd control violence in a riot. These are micro-situational processes. Police violence can be triggered by panicky demonstrators running away and falling down, an emotional field in, what, in which one cop is quickly joined by those alongside him and beating the fallen. And so, all right, the situation where the crowd is broken, I mean, that's, that's really uh, the typical uh, tripping uh, point. Uh, the police are rushing forward into, the, into that situation. Um, the, it may be that, you know, sort of the, you know, the point man, uh, if it's that close of uh, formation, you know, actually you know, hits someone with his 
trash in. And the ones who are behind it were not actually seeing what's in front. They're seeing it that their fellow officer has done, so they'll kind of join in, in on it. So you, you'll get this kind of ripple uh, behavior, little, little clusters of the, this uh, kind of action in time. But each little episode typically ends in a few seconds, and calmer demonstrators can regain emotional equilibrium by facing the police and calling out to them in a clear, decisive voice such expressions as, we are peaceful, what about you? I'm sure this is from the German demonstrations. <laughs> this is an important micro detail in Nassauer's analysis. The tone of voice is crucial. Demonstrators who scream at the police even if the content of what they're saying is also to protest their innocence or their peacefulness, do not change the emotional dynamic. They only add to the tension. Screaming is an expression of being out of control, and that is precisely the problem with the interactional situation. Tension and fear pervades everything, and the violence, in this case by the police who have the superior force, is coming out of the situation of one-sided emotional dominance. The victim who screams does nothing to change the emotional field. It is the strong, calm voice that changes it back towards local equilibrium where the violence stops. Loss of control thus has a double meaning for this pathway to violence. In the tension buildup phase, police organization has lost control of its component parts. In the violent phase, particular clusters of police have in the immediate situation, lost control of their emotions and go into an indiscriminate attack on opponents in their path. Now to the second type of scenario, the demonstrator's offensiveness pathway to violence. The key ingredients here are threats of violence by the demonstrators, typically by a small portion of them, and property damage, again, by a small portion of the crowd. If in the first type of riot, most of the violence is set off by the police. You now that is in that final tipping point phase. In this type, it is the demonstrator starting the violence. But the process is complicated by several not entirely obvious points. Whether violence happens is not simply determined in advance by the organizers of the protest choosing violent and disruptive tactics <coughs> instead of the tactics of peaceful protest. For one thing, the official organizers may decide that the protests will be nonviolent, but it may not turn out that way. In the other direction, protesters or a significant block of them may plan on using violence. But this is upstream from the event itself, and there are contingencies, the emotional field again, that determine whether or not this will happen. Even deliberately chosen violence does not occur automatically. No demonstration starts out from the very first moment by being violent. Even if we plan we're gonna have a, a violent demonstration, minute one is never violent. Violence emerges only at certain times and circumstances. They don't just, the group may decide they're going to use violence, but they don't just rush out and do it. And as time goes along, the occasion may or may not arise. Nassauer's data includes several cases where the announced plan was to be violent, but it never happened. I might add, uh, if we go back and look in detail at Nazi demonstrations in Germany in the 1920s and early 30s, they typically threatened violence, but it did not always happen. Here too, even a group ideologically identified by their commitment to violence did not always have the situational conditions of emotional dominance to produce it. I mean, actually some of the descriptions I've come up with there are really quite ama amazing. Um, I can go into you know, uh, that in the question period if you like. Self-declared violent groups in recent years, the black bloc, have been present in most demonstrations, but a large proportion of these demonstrations are not violence. Even the presence of weapons in demonstrations, usually gathering stones or flammable materials, does not automatically lead to violence. This is in keeping with the microsociology that violence is not easy and occurs only when a facilitating emotional field exists. Threats of violence are rhetorical bluster. I mean, that is the, you know, the, the stones, the, uh, the fire, are efforts at intimidation or self-dramatization. Threatening bluster is present in many kinds of confrontation, but alone is insufficient to produce violence. Photos of the standoff phase of a demonstration often show one or two rock throwers at the front, but the police line remains firm. 
Even more strikingly, the line of demonstrators remains orderly. If we look closely at it, zoom in on the photo, we see that most of the photos are not looking at the rock throwers, but they're turned aside, talking to each other. The few rock throwers, I've called them demonstrative extremists, do not set the mood for the rest of the crowd. In Britain, I understand they're called nutters. <laughs> they are not leaders or precipitators of violence, however much they might want to be. They're recognized on both sides as merely engaging in rhetorical show, which no one else takes seriously. So what does change the emotional atmosphere? Transforming demonstrators into actual attackers at a sufficient level of intensity that the orderly demonstration will turn into the wildly flowing configurations of a violent riot. Nassauer shows that a crucial step is when demonstrators i.e. a sizable fraction of them, escalate the situation by causing property damage, breaking windows, looting, setting fires. Perpetrators such as the Black Bloc tend to define their activity as nonviolence, since, as they say, they are attacking only inanimate objects rather than human beings. But the police find this action provoking and tension raising since it violates their normal commitment to stopping crimes. So now the emotional field is being transformed not only in the increased arousal of the people who are destroying the property, a collective mood that sweeps up at least some persons into group excitement and tense enthusiasm, but also the increased, increased tension on the side of the police. A more subtle consequence is the way it affects the demonstrators as a whole. A minority of 10% or less of a demonstration may engage in property damage but it affects the other 90% by making them also more tense. The majority dislike their betrayal of themselves and may even attempt to stop the property destroyers. It also makes them fearful of what the police will do. This creates an emotional field pervaded by tension on both sides. Both the demonstrators and the police become more upset when extensive property damage occurs. This pervasive tension and fear on both sides sets the stage for the tipping points at which violence breaks out. The orderliness of the demonstration is broken, and that of the police as well. Here, orderliness is not just a metaphor. In photos and videos, the standoff phase of a demonstration looks entirely different from the violent phase. In the standoff, both sides stand in solid lines, both visibly manifesting their organized unity. When violence breaks out, both lines break into little fragments running about in space. During the standoff phase, lines remain unified. During the violence phase, phase the crowd breaks into clusters. Why? The standoff of two lines of opponents is a static situation. It is an emotional equilibrium. Confrontational tension is matched on both sides and acts as a barrier to violence getting going. A few individuals may attempt to shatter the barrier, but they fail. It is when the physical co configuration of the group changes that violence becomes possible. Most violence, and you can s see this in, you know, in photos over and over again, takes the form of a cluster of between three and seven members of one side attacking an isolated victim from the other. Photos show this can happen on either side, a circle of half a dozen police beating one or two of the crowd, or vice versa. I should add that riots between ethnic groups or soccer hooligans, the same clustering appeared. One side with a frenzied attack when they get a local numerical majority against an isolated individual or two from the other side. This is a field of emotional domination. Particularly dangerous for the victim is falling down, turning your back. Whatever possibility there had been to equilibrate the emotional definition of the situation is gone because one side of the conflict is no longer facing the other. Quite literally, it is no longer a confrontation, front to front, face to face. The majority of successful violence of all kinds is done when the victim is turned away. And this is what makes the disorderliness of the riot so dangerous. Whereas the big lines protected the individuals within them by a front of emotional solidarity, now the running around, and especially the running away, opens up the possibility for little groups to get total emotional domination over isolates from the other side. And this is where physical damage happens. One more finding from Nassauer's research. The time sequence traverses a danger time zone. 
the period between one and a half hours to two and a half hours after the demonstration has begun is the danger zone when violence is most likely to be triggered. Before this time, that is before about 90 minutes, not enough tension is built up. Past that time, that is about two and a half to three hours in, the demonstration loses whatever tension it may, may have developed. There are, of course, many different kinds of violence and with somewhat different pathways through them. I hope I've made the point by giving details from Nassauer's data that the dynamics of emotional fields over time is the key, both to the buildup of violent threat and to what happens thereafter. In conclusion, and another water break. <coughs> Unlike most social science studying violence, the findings of microsociology are optimistic. If the underlying problem is poverty or discrimination or early family experience or a culture of rebellion and excitement, then the prospects for curbing violence are low because these are not things that we easily solve and we're certainly not going in the direction of solving poverty, for instance. On the other hand, if long-term motives are weak determinants because they still have to go through the eye of the situational needle, Prospects are much better. Situational conditions usually do not favor violence because of the barrier of confrontational tension. That is to say, equilibrium in the emotional field of confrontation. The practical task of preventing violence, then, is to provide techniques for keeping confrontations from tipping into emotional domination. Here's a list of suggestions, starting from what we learned from research on the microsociology of riots. Don't turn your back. In a situation of violent threat, don't hide your face. Don't run away in panic. Above all, don't fall down. That is to say, your eyes and your face are your strongest weapon of defense. Keep up a clear confrontation with a potential attacker, but don't raise the level of tension. Don't make further threats. Don't scream. Just keep it as steady as you can. Recall Nassar's evidence that calling out in a clear, strong voice we are peaceful, how about you? Uh, or words to that effect is often successful in bringing the situation back into emotional equilibrium. The exact wording would depend on what the local discourse happens to be. But there's evidence, as in Joe Krupnik's ethnography of gangland killers on the streets of Chicago, that every social milieu has a language, verbal and nonverbal, in which a threatening situation can be kept in equilibrium. The desk clerk in the Atlanta school this last August, who calmed down an armed man threatening a rampage shooting, shows that even the most dangerous situations may be diffused. Research colleagues have told me they have walked through a violent riot in Tehran by keeping in mind what emotional tone they are projecting with their body language, playing neither attacker nor victim. Stefan Klusmann's research on tipping points to genocidal ethnic cleansing in Bosnia and Rwanda shows that even in the midst of a mass murder campaign, there are micro situational stumbling blocks and threatened victims sometimes escape by a timely show of emotional resoluteness. You will notice that my practical advice so far has been to the participants themselves this is not the usual sort of official policy recommendation, which may or may not make their way down to ordinary people. But if psychologists can give advice directly to individuals, so can microsociologists. It is advice about trying to manage the emotional situation of confrontation at whatever level of violence they threaten. Taking the point of view of a civilian, I would add that ordinary citizens can also help prevent police violence. Recognize that police are normally under tension which is easily escalated by situational stress. If you deal with a cop, you are better off if you try to keep the officer's mood calm. If you dislike and distrust the police, nonetheless, you can tell yourself it is you who are taking command of the situation if you can affect the emotional equilibrium. I'm not usually in the business of giving advice to the police, but here I'll point out some implications of microsociology. Police training would be better if it explicitly focused on the emotional tensions of situations of po police citizen confrontation. Patrol officers should be aware in, of how to measure in detail their own tension and of the dangers that develop as the tension rapidly escalates in situations like suspect resistance or police chases. The biggest danger is what I have called forward panic, 
where resistance or frustration builds tension among officers. So when the suspect is finally caught, they are unliable to unleash, unleash a good deal of aggression. In short, police training should increase the amount of attention to the warning signs of emotional tension and techniques for getting one's own emotions under control. Police should also become systematically aware that the danger of using excess force increases with the number of officers called to the scene, <coughs> i.e. holding constant the amount of actual threat. The more officers on the uh, scene, the more likelihood there is going to be police violence. These are group emotion amplifying processes among the police. One version of this is rumor propagation. Rumors are amplified in the telling, and this pattern applies to police communications as well. Psychological experiments on transmitting emotions show that each person who hears a message tends to simplifying it, omitting the distinctive details and substituting more conventional phrasing. By the time the message has passed through half a dozen links, it generally has turned into the most cliched form. An instance comes from an unarmed man threatening suicide on a highway ramp in Los Angeles. As more and more police backup were called to the scene, from a variety of jurisdictions, so there were many transmitting links, the message had been transformed into an armed man had been firing at police cars and helicopters. The result was the would-be suicide was shot over 100 times, you know, with a fair amount of wild shooting and collateral damage. A more famous case in 2009 involved the arrest of a prominent black scholar, Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates, at his home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I don't know whether this is made the news over here, it was big news in the United States. Professor Gates arrived home from a trip to find his front door was jammed, and the taxi driver helped him to get it, to get it open. A passerby phoned the police. The two men, one of them black, with suitcases, were trying to open a door. The police dispatcher changed this into two black men with back, backpacks were breaking in. By the time the police arrived, they were primed to look for a violent armed robber. Professor Gates, who is you know, generally a you know, quite fa famous person, and he certainly is aware of himself, was understandably indignant, but he was no microsociologist, and he angered the police officer instead of calming him down. The officer was no racist, and neither was the Harvard employee phoned in the report. The problem was in the rumor-like transmission of messages and the failure to recognize that transmission of emotion-laden messages is a problem even in a high-tech communication system. In the end, these are solvable problems with greater awareness of microsociology. A great deal of, of violence can be avoided. Thank you very much. <laughs>